All right. Good afternoon, everyone. If you're Alicia, if you're on the East Coast, I know Dr. Gupta is all the way on the West Coast. So good morning to his folks, too. Um, thank you guys for joining us this morning. We were talking COVID therapies uh, with Dr. Gupta and Dr. Williams. Uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping announcements. I want to congratulate our 2021 20, uh, class of 40 under 40 winners. I believe both D Mia Keys, future Dr. Mia Keys, and uh, Dr. Gupta were in the same class for 2017, so they have uh, some more uh, colleagues joining them. So we want to congratulate uh, them, and you know you've seen the press releases and the uh, other information, hopefully. And then finally, we have our big summit on health disparities, uh, and at the end of April, the last Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of April. So just join and register and learn more, like you're going to learn today from these fine gentlemen and this young lady, who I will pass it over to. So, Mia. As always, Brandon and NMQF family, it's great to join you on Friday. I always say this is my favorite part of, of, of my week, you know, just, just coming in and, and having um, really timely conversations with you all and also just really building our own, our, our collective skill sets and navigating this new world as, as we know it, right? Um, and so today, as Brandon mentioned, we're joined by Dr. Mark Williams and Dr. Ben Gupta. And between the two of them and the three of us, we're going to unpack some things not just about COVID-19 uh, as, as you know, the state of COVID right now, at least in, in the States, but we're also gonna talk a little bit about therapeutics, right? Which a lot of people have questions about, especially because now the conversation is, is, is less on COVID-19 testing. It's, it's right now on vaccines, but people have questions about therapeutics. So joining us today, as I mentioned, we have Dr. Mark Williams, who's a, uh, he's a pulmonary and critical care physician who's been um, also in the academy in, 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 in uh, academics for over 25 years now. And he, he joins us, um, he's, he's currently at his uh, at Indiana University School of Medicine, or at least he had, he's been there for a long time. I'm very excited for you to bring that perspective today, but you'll also be talking to us from your, your perspective as the senior medical director of COVID-19, of the COVID-19 therapeutic platform um, at Eli Lilly and Company. And so we're, we're quite grateful that she'll be able to extend the conversation from both your lens as an academician, but then also your lens from, from the pharmaceutical standpoint. Um, both are really quite critical to this conversation. And then we have with us also, as Brandon mentioned, my, my fellow 40 under 40 um, mem uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Van Gupta, who many of you have seen consistently, maybe over breakfast or over lunch or over dinner, whichever time he's coming on, on, on TV. So Dr. Gupta, he's spent about the last 15 years or so um, working across the globe to improve public health related um, ventures for organizations and agencies like the CDC, Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation in, in the state of Washington, the Harvard Global Health Institute, WHO in Geneva, and uh, the Pentagon Center for Global Health. Engagement. So he's also going to bring his expertise today um, to talk to us a little bit about where we are in terms of the state of COVID, and then we're going to get into a bit specific to therapeutics. So, Dr. Gupta, Dr. Williams, both of you are welcome. I appreciate your time today. We're going to turn it over to Dr. Gupta to give us some opening words. And Vinny, you're, you're talking there. We see you. Oops, sorry, um, was muted. Uh, it's great to be back uh, at the, uh, the forum uh, to talk about uh, COVID therapeutics and uh, great to share a stage with Dr. Williams and, and Mia, good to see you again. Um, I am going to share my screen um, to help level set on where we are in the pandemic. Mia, can you see my screen? Just wanted to confirm before I- I can, yes. Okay, perfect. I'll, I'll keep this brief, but I, I, I'm sure many of you saw uh, President Biden's address yesterday uh, when it comes to what we can expect with uh, vaccine availability, um, hopefully May 1st, which is, I, I think, certainly well ahead of schedule uh, in terms of broad availability to the vaccine. Um, I, as a, Also, as a pulmonologist, I'll say, you know, Dr. Williams, a pulmonologist, is, is really heartening news, so we don't have to continue to... to to see the influx of patients into ICUs across the country with severe COVID-19 pneumonia. Um, putting on my, uh, just what my colleagues and I at IHME have been focused on for, for the last 14 months has been forecasting what we expect uh, from this virus in terms of case rates, in, in terms of expected hospitalizations and deaths. 
And I think these, these graphs really uh, are most illustrative about what we can expect. I wanna draw your attention to specifically figure 19 here. This is the green line is what we're hoping is gonna happen with broad access to vaccines. Of course, that ramp up that we're expecting toward in the next few months and by May 1st, broad availability. We're expecting uh, daily deaths to really uh, significantly decline uh, by the end of June. And so hopefully it's gonna be at, at a place that's very manageable uh, where we wouldn't, we feel like we'll have adequately flatten the curve, health systems will not be stressed, and, and we can really think about opening up. There is the theoretical risk that we don't follow that trajectory. And so th this purple scenario here, we've never followed. That's what happens if all of us adopt masking uh, in mass, 95% of the population, you know, at best we're at about 75% adoption. So I'll ignore that. But it's really between this green line and, and the pink line up here. And that pink line uh, is, uh, there's a few variables that that could predict a pandemic that continues at, 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 the, at the rate that it's currently at well into the summer. And that's human behavior, our behavior fundamentally changing as the weather gets warmer in many parts of the country, as governors like Governor Abbott, for example, as they potentially may be uh, too early um, uh, open up their states and remove mask mandates. If we see that type of uh, pattern re replicate itself across the country, uh, we're, that might portend a, an inc a, a longer duration of the pandemic. So that's number one. Number two, the variants are of concern to all of us uh, for a few reasons, but one of which is there is some degree, there is now some degree of certainty that all the vaccines will protect you and keep you out of the ICU, regardless of whether or not you're exposed to the original wild type version of the virus or whether you're exposed to some of these new variants first discovered um, in countries overseas. What it seems clear though, uh, what's, become, what's becoming more clear is these vaccines will not prevent uh, poten the potential of asymptomatic infection, meaning, you can get vaccinated and then get exposed to one of these variants and unwittingly become a, a transmitter of the virus to those who may not be vaccinated, which is why you're seeing CDC come out very strongly and say, uh, the guidance for individuals who's, who are now vaccinated is, is we're, we're opening things up a bit. You can liberalize parts of your life, but we're not recommending you, for example, travel. You're seeing the CDC be very conservative and it's specifically for this reason and this reason alone, that if we have a bunch of individuals start traveling and acting as though life is normalized in the setting of these variants, in the setting of most of the country still not fully vaccinated, we could follow a, a trajectory that would, would lead to a never ending pandemic. So that's why in closing, uh, um, uh, for at least this part of the talk, I'll say, it's important for the next three months that we remain vigilant, that we continue to do everything that we've already been doing for the last 14 months so that we can bring case rates as, as low as possible as vaccines are ramping up so that we can truly flatten the curve and be done. But there is that risk, again, that that, that may not happen. And a lot of this is contingent on human behavior. I'll stop there. Dr. Gupta, thank you for that. I think we're gonna come back to a lot of what you mentioned in, in our uh, questions later on, um, but I want to open the floor up to Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams, tell us a little bit about therapeutics and, and, and why having the conversation around therapeutics is significant with respect to getting to that green curve um, as opposed to the other colored curves that Dr. Gupta mentioned. Yes, thank you very much, Mia. And once again, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I'm going to uh, share my screen. I'm hopeful that it will work. So if you could just give me the heads up that that is uh, projecting, that would be wonderful. You're all good. Okay. And please just let me know if there's a technical difficulty uh, th with the sharing. So once again, thank you very much. My name is Mark Williams. I'm a uh, pulmonary critical care physician, have been uh, involved in COVID-19 uh, since the beginning of the, of the pandemic. In terms of caring for patients, I've uh, had the pleasure of caring for over 300 individual patients. And um, 
recently made a move back to uh, the pharmaceutical industry to head up the, um, the, the medical aspects of the COVID-19 platform. So as part of that, I am a representative of Eli Lilly and Company and an employee. So I, I'm required to provide um, a, a broad uh, range of uh, information regarding our products. So that's what I will be doing in the next few slides. So if you can bear with me on some of the slides that are required, I would appreciate that. We did start our program approximately one year ago, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that in the next uh, maybe 15 minutes. And uh, it's been quite a, um, an exciting uh, path for Eli Lilly to get back into infectious disease. Some of you will probably remember that for, for many years, even decades, Lilly was really well known for its infectious disease work and then moved on to some different areas, but now has come back full force in this area. So um, we're gonna talk about a couple of molecules, which are um, monoclonal antibodies to help combat COVID-19. I want to start out by saying that US FDA has not approved these molecules. These are not approved drugs. They have not been proven to be safe nor effective. What has occurred is that the FDA has issued emergency use authorization to permit the emergency use of, first of all, bamlanivimab uh, at a dose of 700 milligrams, or the combination of two antibodies, bamlanivimab and edisivimab. Again, this is approved for emergency use only for patients who have mild to moderate COVID-19, who are both adult and pediatric, but for pediatrics, you have to be 12 years or older. You have to have a recent positive uh, SARS-CoV-2 viral test, and you have to be considered high risk of progressing to severe COVID-19 and or needing hospitalization. So we'll talk about what high risk means in a moment. So I wanted to start with that slide. There are some limitations to the use of these, these two drugs, which are very important to point out. So bamlanivimab alone and bamlanivimab and edisivimab in combination have not been have not been authorized to be used in patients who are hospitalized uh, due to COVID-19 or patients who require oxygen therapy as an outpatient or patients who may have been on oxygen therapy and they've had to turn up their oxygen because of COVID-19. These drugs are not authorized for use in those patients and primarily because we've studied hospitalized patients and there was no positive signal for benefit uh, with these, with bamlanivimab alone, and therefore the FDA did not authorize that. So we're talking about ambulatory patients, patients in the in the outpatient setting. So again, I went through that the that bamlanivimab and bamlanivimab plus edisivimab have not been approved by the FDA, but they have been uh, granted emergency use authorization. There's a lot of information about these uh, antibodies um, that you can really dig in. I would highly recommend you go to uh, a website such as bamlanivimab.com. There's also another web website, lilyantibody.com, which really can help you uh, understand further. And there's uh, important things like fact sheets for healthcare providers, fact sheets for patients and caregivers, uh, as well as the letter of authorization. So that is the disclaimer for bamlanivimab alone. There's also a disclaimer for the combination of bamlanivimab and edisivimab, which was granted emergency use authorization on February 9th of this year. And again, if you're interested in the combination, there's a, a, a very uh, informational website, www.bamaneti.com, that can provide all the information that uh, you may be looking for. So with any molecule uh, that's used in patients, we have to be very cognizant of any potential safety problems. And so we have, this is early with these two molecules, and so we have some limited clinical data, but what we have learned is that there is a warning regarding hypersensitivity, uh, meaning that there might be some reaction to the infusion, including uh, the most severe reaction, which would be anaphylaxis. You might have heard of um, for example, someone with a peanut allergy get exposed and go into anaphylactic shock. Thankfully, that's a very rare occurrence with these two antibodies, but it's it's been seen in just a handful of patients, so we need to be aware of it. The one safety um, um, 
effect that we have seen is in is infusion related reactions and so that has occurred in just over approximately one percent of the population that's received um, the, the two drugs or bamlanivimab alone or the combination and so what does that mean an infusion related reaction well that means you're having some some such as fever, chills, fatigue, reduced oxygen saturation, chest pain. There's a long list of things that can go along with that. So it's, it's certainly uh, encouraged that if this occurs, that you stop the infusion and, and administer appropriate medications and supportive care, such as Tylenol or Benadryl, for example. So that's some of the important uh, safety information. And there's also some safety information that potentially patients could have clinical worsening of their COVID-19 after they administer, have administered of the, the bamlanivimab. Uh, so we have to keep an eye out for that. Thankfully, it's relatively uncommon, but we have to be aware of that. And again, we want to point out that these are drugs that are not approved for your patient who's hospitalized in the intensive care unit or even on the medical surgical ward. The, the drugs have, the drug bamlanivimab has been studied in that fashion and it is not, uh, does not appear to be effective and therefore it's not uh, able to be used in those patients. So we're really talking about using monoclonal antibodies in patients who, um, who are sick, they're ill and they're at risk of developing severe problems, but again, they're in the outpatient setting or the ambulatory setting. And again, some more safety information. I, I mentioned that map alone has, has some potential safety um, concerns. And also the combination, you might see some things like nausea, uh, some itching, some, some fever. So we have to be aware of that. Finally, there's uh, not a lot of data with these uh, molecules in, in women who are pregnant. And so we have to always have a, a caution about that. And there's also no data on, on for uh, infants who are being breastfeed, breastfed. Uh, so we have to, again, recognize that limitation of use. So uh, that's a lot of the background information that I am required to, to go through. It's important information. So we want to handle that up front. But now let's talk a little bit more about how these monoclonal antibodies might make a difference for patients. And so we have uh, learned a lot about this virus, certainly. Um, the, the coronavirus we are very familiar with in, um, in the practice of medicine, and most people are familiar with it because they've had a, a common cold. Uh, certainly, we know that this is not a simple common cold. The uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus has been devastating uh, for, for patients and, and uh, countries around the world. We see that play out on a daily basis. But we understand, I think, quite well the pathophysiology and how this virus really does the damage it does to our patients. So this is on the, uh, the left-hand part of the slide, you have the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and it was recognized quite early, and then this had actually been known from previous coronaviral studies over the years, that this spike protein or the S protein, which you see here in red, was quite important because that is what allowed the virus to attach to type two uh, respiratory epithelial cells or pneumocytes via this uh, very uh, nice receptor called the ACE2 receptor. And then there's also a, um, a protease called uh, TEMPRSS2, um, which uh, facilitates the entry of this virus by cleaving this receptor, essentially opening up the door for the virus to come in to the cell and when the virus comes into the cell, that's unfortunately where it can really do its damage and unfortunately replicate to continue to move on and infect other cells. So what cells are we talking about? Talking about? Well, there are a lot of cells that the SARS-CoV-2 virus binds to. It's not just uh, lung epithelial cells. It, it can bind to the GI tract, the nasal mucosa, even the, even the, the cardiac uh, myocyte cells. So there's a lot of different cells that this virus binds to, and it certainly helps explain the multitude of signs and symptoms we see in our patients. So let's uh, talk a little bit about these two molecules. So the, the first molecule that Eli Lilly and company moved into rapidly into the, the clinic to be studied was bamlanivimab. 
Uh, it's a fully human IgG, so IgG would be a, a, a very common uh, protective antibody that really is unmodified. It was derived from B cells of a patient who had actually recovered quite early from COVID-19 in the uh, northwestern part of the United States. And we know that it binds to, uh, RBD stands for receptor binding domain. So this is an example of, of, of the antibody coming in and blocking, actually blocking the entry of the spike protein and therefore the virus into cells because essentially you cover up the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. And so uh, we have a lot of preclinical data looking at these viruses in petri dishes and also in small animals and even primates. And so that was the first antibody that Eli Lilly and company rolled out. Um, there was a second antibody in partnership with a, a company called Jushi from uh, China, which was a a similar antibody in the fact that it binds to the spike protein. However, it binds to a different region of the spike protein. And this was also a, an antibody that was derived from B cells from a patient who had recovered from COVID-19 in China. So it's a receptor binding domain um, antibody. It blocks that, uh, but it blocks in a separate epitope. Epitope means a different region. And so the way I like to describe this is if, if you had a child in harm, would you rather have one arm around that child or two? That's a kind of a simple analogy. So it's, it's allowing blocking on two different areas to hopefully do this very important uh, physiologic effect, block viral attachment to epithelial cells, therefore block viral RNA entry and then viral replication. And again, this antibody had a lot of different um, preclinical data as well. So we mentioned early that these antibodies are indicated for patients who are what we would consider high risk of developing severe COVID-19. And if you, if you develop severe COVID-19, your, your signs and symptoms are significant enough that you're probably needing to think about going to the emergency room or even to go to the hospital. So for example, I had COVID-19 quite early. I, I, got, I was, I think, the second physician exposed in my hospital, and I had what I would consider moderate COVID-19. I never really progressed to um, really needing emergency room uh, evaluation or hospitalization, thankfully. And that's because I really did not have uh, these particular risk factors. So what, what does FDA considered high risk? You have a body mass index that, that's quite high, greater than 35. You have chronic kidney trouble, diabetes. You're, you're having some um, condition that is causing your body to be immunosuppressed, meaning you don't respond normally to infections. You have a, a weakened immune system. Maybe you're on medication that is on purpose trying to weaken your immune system to treat your disease, or you're older, you're, for example, 65 years age or older. Or if you have, uh, if you're 55 or older and you have either heart disease, hypertension, or some chronic lung disease, then you're considered high risk. And then what about children? And when we talk about children, we're talking about 12 through 17. Again, high risk would be considered you have a high body mass index, meaning greater than 85 percentile for their age and gender based on growth charts. You have, uh, unfortunately, common problems such as sickle cell disease, congenital or acquired heart disease, neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, medical related technologic dependence. Uh, so for example, you might need a, uh, a chronic tracheostomy on a ventilator, something like that, or you have some chronic lung problems. So that is how we define high risk. And those are the only patients who are eligible for, this, for these uh, antibody therapies. So I mentioned Eli Lilly got uh, entered into this um, arena quite early, approximately last um, March, and went very quickly. We had a very large clinical program with many different types of studies. The one I'm going to really focus on would be our landmark study called Blaze One. And Blaze One is, again, for ambulatory patients, meaning they're outside the hospital, they've been recently diagnosed. Uh, we've studied uh, over 2,400 patients in that study, both bamlanivimab alone and bamlanivimab plus edisivimab uh, versus placebo. And we've presented quite a lot of those uh, results um, 
We've released, released them publicly. We've presented them into major medical journals and we'll continue to share that data in a transparent way. Uh, we have a lot of other studies that I'm not going to focus on. We're gonna just talk a little bit about the summary of this data. So uh, as we started this program, the initial endpoints, and when we looked at some interim results, uh, we were looking at things like viral load what is the ability of the antibody to, to reduce viral load? Because we know that correlates with a reduction in symptoms and, and signs of, of COVID-19, but also the reduction in viral load, we believe leads to a decreased risk for hospitalization and even death potentially. So we uh, released some interim results that, that really provided some evidence that bamlanivimab alone was having a significant effect as a, as a therapeutic neutralizing antibody it was able to help neutralize the virus. And again, ambulatory patients. Uh, we did talk a little bit about some adverse events. Thankfully, they were relatively low incidence of adverse effects. What we might see again are some nausea, some diarrhea, dizziness, headache, uh, some skin itching and vomiting. So that's the data that came from bamlanivimab alone and that led to FDA granting the emergency use authorization for the uh, single antibody treatment. And then subsequently, we began to study these two antibodies together, and that was in the same study known as BLAZE-1. The, uh, the primary endpoint was looking at a change from baseline in, in viral load at day 11. That primary endpoint was met. We had secondary endpoints at different times, uh, reducing viral load assessment, and that was met. We again uh, looked at a lot of different clinical endpoints and we were able to demonstrate approximately a 70% reduction in COVID-19 hospitalization and ER visits. And that actually was similar to what we observed with bamlanivimab alone. We saw a similar range of adverse effects with the combination uh, compared to bamlanivimab alone. So this, these data resulted in, on February 9th, the FDA granted emergency use authorization for the combination of bamlanivimab and nevacivimab. So uh, a, a common question will, will be, why did you combine the two? If, if the, the bamlanivimab alone looked so effective, why did you bring along a second antibody? And it's really a pretty simple answer. The, the reason is that we, had predicted, like all viruses, they, they tend to change over time. And there was uh, early concern that over time these viruses change and that you might need additional therapies um, and, and putting therapies together to, to get even more effect uh, potentially down the road. And so that's a high level overview of our, our program. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my slide and then turning that back over to, uh, to Mia. Thank you. Dr. Williams, you say high level, but I think you gave us such in-depth information, you know, and so we're going to, we're going to pick some of that apart so that the audience can, can think about it with respect to um, where we are right now. And, you know, if I can, if I can attach a three month um, timeframe to it, because Dr. Gupta, I do want to go back to some of the comments that you made, you know, um, I wanted to think about, and, and, and the two of you to help us unpack what is the role of therapeutics or how can we consider the role of therapeutics over the, the, the course of the you know, first quarter of 2021 through to the summer? You know, how are we supposed to think about it? Especially because uh, you mentioned Dr. Gupta that a number of states are, are opening and, and, and arguably way earlier than, than necessary. Just last week, Dr. Puckrin was on to talk to us about how you know, oftentimes the economy doesn't support the uh, the biology of people. So I have I actually have like three questions in one, but I wanna start with, you know, Dr. Gupta, what is the role of therapeutics? How do you think about therapeutics and getting us to that that fine line, uh, that, that desirable line that you mentioned? So, so me, I, you know, I think ultimately I, I, therapeutics has a role to play um, but I, I would divide up uh, sort of the epi of uh, the epidemiology and how we think this pandemic is gonna is gonna end from the role of therapeutics. This pandemic ends through vaccination and through us minimizing case transmission. So 
buckling down, as, as mentioned earlier, I do think therapeutics um, is, uh, can help mitigate the loss of life. And so we're, we're estimating here at IHME that you know, anywhere from 60,000 additional Americans uh, may lose their life between now and July 1st until vac vaccines are really rooted in all communities. Um, but that number could be as high as 130,000. And, and, and a lot of that has, again, has to do with public policy and less to do with these monoclonals. I think monoclonals have been sorely underutilized for reasons I'm sure Dr. Williams can, can also talk about. But from what I've seen here in Seattle um, and then with colleagues across at least the West Coast, um, access is a big issue. Um, there's a lot of information asymmetry that you know I, we've been working together on been working with HHS on how do you get information that Dr. Williams presented in that slide to people so they know to ask for these medications. One, how do you get providers to want to prescribe them? There's some provider hesitation, um, especially uh, amongst emergency room docs, et cetera, uh, and that I think will have will be addressed with the recent change in NIH treatment guidance. They, they just made a change on February 23rd that went from equivocal to yes, let's go ahead and, and do the combo therapy that Dr. Williams just discussed. And I think that was gonna be important to convince infectious disease docs and, and our emergency room colleagues to, to start prescribing this more. But then I'll, I'll give an example. I had, a, I had a physician colleague at UCLA who was trying to get access to a monoclonal therapy for a loved one in Southern California. And it was, it's really, it was hard. I, you know, we went to combatcovid.hhs.gov. It was hard to find an infusion center that worked there. So then we went to uh, uh, our HHS therapeutics colleagues that, and, and they sort of canvassed around. Um, and, and we found in a home infusion service that was going to be able to deliver this medication, but it's tough. Uh, you know, uh, that's a lot of friction. And imagine if you're if you don't have a contact, if you don't know how to escalate, if you can't find that information through your local doc or provider, it's it's a challenge. So I'd love Dr. Williams' thoughts on that because I, I found that to be really challenging. Yes, thank you. Um, at, at Lilly, we recognized quite early that this was a mindset change for people, and and it was going to require a lot of education regarding what are monoclonal antibodies. Uh, are are they are they are they potentially safe to give? Uh, what setting do you have to give it in? What type of monitoring do you need? And it it's required a, a very large lift um, with um, Health and Human Services CDC working all together to come up with educational campaigns. Um, so that's been a a very big effort. Uh, you probably have seen some of these campaigns show up on, on various social media channels and things um, regarding getting the word out about the, uh, about the antibodies, in particular to areas of, of the country which, which historically have been underserved. And so we have been, I, I believe, working quite hard at that. And there are a lot of resources that are available for folks that they can go out. As Dr. Gupta mentioned, we have we have the COVID-19 therapeutics at hhs.gov. We also have uh, the National Infusion Center Association website where you can go on and you can find, you know, you can find maps where, where people can hopefully get the therapies. Uh, I know there's been some frustration regarding the hours of operation potentially and what do you do on a weekend. It seems like people need therapy, you know, at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. And, and so that can be a challenge for folks. We have seen the utilization go up dramatically over the last few weeks, and we've seen, a, I think, a lot of benefits of these educational campaigns. There's still more work to do, but we, we are very encouraged by the progress that, that has been, that has been uh, exhibited in the last few weeks. So for the audience, Dr. Gupta just dropped the HHS link that both he and Dr. Williams are referring to. It's in the chat. And by the way, again, if you have questions, drop them in the Q&A below and just keep the conversations flowing in the chat, but give me the questions in the Q&A. So for the both of you, I want to I want to pick I want to get back to the biology of of the of the therapeutics themselves of the, of the monoclonals because I think that, that that's something that people are still grappling with is such high literacy, health literacy related work. But I also want to get to the point that, that both of you have also made with respect to access, right? This conversation of access to not only to 
therapies themselves, but to information about them, you know, this has been the the tale really of 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 COVID ever since you know we had issues with access to testing, we had issues with access to the vaccine, and we we continue to um, to you know find better ways be and best ways to really burgeon access. What have we learned with respect to access for for the monoclonal antibodies for the therapeutics? How, or rather, how have we learned from the access issues of testing and vaccines, and and what are some takeaways that potentially are being used with um, guiding people to better understand monoclonals? Or are we still learning, or or where do we need to go? Like, how how can we move some of the? How can we learn from the past? the very recent and ongoing past, if that makes sense. Well, I, I guess I'll just start. I, we, we are still learning, there's no doubt. We're, we're learning every day. And um, it, it seems to me that if we can, if we can really focus on some simple things like, like pictures, to be honest with you. So I had the picture where I show the virus and I show you the spike protein and then I show you the receptor and, and I talk about how the receptor cleaves. When it receptor cleaves, it means it opens the door for viral entry. And if we can kind of describe it that way is that, look, we're gonna shut the door. We're gonna, we're gonna block access that the virus has to these critical cells by shutting the door. Um, that gets us away from all these technical terms like persistent high viral load and viral titers at day 11 and all that, which, you know, quite frankly, even, even some of us in science have a hard time wrapping our heads around that. So I, I think it, it gets back to thinking about, okay, what about third grade level science? And it's, it's not that we're dumbing it down. We're just trying to, you know, not, not everybody can read a couple of paragraphs and digest that. Some, many people, you know, my younger son is a very graphic learner. So you have to show him something on picture and he has to draw it out. And so I think, you know, we've, we've learned along the way that those are very important tools, I would say. I get, you know, I would, I would just layer on to, to what Dr. Williams just mentioned and I, I, you know, one, an additional problem. So I, I agree, health literacy and just making people understand what these monoclonals do, just like what do vaccines do and how are they different from each other? And this is the, the great challenge of our times is effective public health communication. But, you know, fundamentally, I, I sit on the board of a few federally qualified community health centers. And basically what we're asking health systems and primary care clinics and emergency rooms to do is, well, less of ERs, but infusion sites and places where you would actually get access to monoclonals is please test, please vaccinate. And oh, by the way, please also give monoclonals. We're expecting the same parts of our healthcare system to do many things that they generally don't do when they're not in the pandemic. So the resources and the infrastructure are just not there. I mean, it's as, it's as simple as the logistics to get to find a place where there's a provider to give you the infusion is challenging because there isn't a dedicated anteroom or a place where you can isolate COVID positive patients in, a, in an outpatient clinic to receive a therapy like a monoclonal because these clinics don't have enough space to, to create that isolation space. They don't wanna mix COVID positive patients with their, their regular patient flow. And so as a result, they're saying, well, we're not gonna offer this monoclonal. So, I, I mean, we just don't have enough sites, number one. Number two is that it's the information asymmetry. People don't know to ask for it. When they do know to ask for it, they go to this website. Sometimes the website gives them the key, sometimes it doesn't. And then mm -hmm. you're left contacting manufacturers or trying to contact folks like myself and Dr. Williams to, to, to figure out if we can find a connection. So that's a problem. And, uh, and then the number three, it's provider is actually our colleagues, Dr. Williams and I, our colleagues in healthcare, there's, there has been resistance to adopting this medication, especially folks that you need to buy into it, like, like frontline ER docs, uh, where often people, vulnerable, vulnerable populations will seek care in emergency rooms um, often. Uh, and 
uh, emergency room docs in particular have noticed um, are, are skeptical of the, of the uh, or have been historically in the last few months, skeptical of the evidence. I hope that's changed in light of our leading experts at the NIH endorsing it. But I mean, there, there, so there, there are a lot, there's a complicated <laughs> set of barriers here as to why this has been underutilized. I would add, I think those are great comments. I would ask, I would add one other thing. And I think it's, it's, it's cost. People have been quite, I think, appropriately concerned that, hey, I can't afford this. I would love for my family member to get this, but we can't afford this. And they, they tell us it's all going to be okay. And then I'm going to get a large bill uh, from an infusion center or something. I think that's a very real. And so I'm actually very, very pleased with the, the relationship we were able to form with the U.S. government to have, have these therapies purchased at no cost for the patient. Uh, and even in, so if you're a Medicare patient, the infusion costs, which are in, in general are relatively, I think, modest, uh, that's all picked up by Medicare. And, and so, uh, you know, Eli Lilly, we've been very, very uh, happy to partner with the U.S. government to, to, to really make sure those, those drugs are available to everyone across the country, no matter the ability to pay. Yeah, I mean, you, you're both making such significant points, and it's it, it, it comes down to access, it comes down to cost. And um, I, I truly appreciate you you bringing up the, the coverage part. What about with, with private insurance? I mean, particularly for, you know, are, are, there, are there differences for bamlanivimab by itself in terms of cost or, or, or it with edisivimab? And forgive me if I keep looking down, my dog is literally like, like come play with me. So he's he yeah. is no <laughs> Yeah. So you know, we in our experience, most most insurances have been picking up the cost uh, of the infusion. And then I mentioned Medicare. So, but the contracts are with the U.S. government for for the molecules for the drugs, and so those those costs have been taken care of. So that you know, the patients are not going to be receiving bills for for. Bamalim Mab alone or BAM plus Eddy, that's that's not part of the equation at all. Okay, good to know. Let, let's talk a bit about so you so you both mentioned um, hesitancy and resistance on, on the part of the providers, right? And we do know that when it comes to not even just therapeutics and, and not even with COVID, just just uh, engaging with the healthcare system in general the idea that one's provider looks like the patient or, or has a similar life experience or, or can relate to where they come from, that matters, right? So I'm wondering to what extent is Eli Lilly thinking about representativeness and, and also not only just in terms of, of providing or, or encouraging providers themselves with, with good information, but also in terms of looping in the providers to help to spread the word about clinical trials around the around around the the testing of, of therapeutics. What do, what do we what do we know so far about representation? I, I can comment from from a Lilly perspective. We we have a serious dedication to making sure we we are representing everyone, and, and that includes in our clinical trials. And so we have a strong commitment to diversity throughout our company, in particular when it comes to clinical research and 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 having partnerships with organizations that that's really their mission is to make sure that there's proper education about clinical research. We know, we know all the, the, the tragic things that have happened in the past to, to minority populations in terms of research. And it's, it's devastating and it needs to be improved upon year by year, month by month, day by day. So we, we, have, a lot of, we have a lot of strong commitment to that. Our, our clinical trial patients, I, I would argue, are, are a diverse group. We've, we've been very focused on that uh, and we will continue to focus on that. Yeah, that's good to know. I, I know a number of our of our audience members are are also equally engaged and and committed to ensuring that you know that doesn't fall by the wayside. Whether you're talking about clinical trials representation amongst the healthcare workforce, and not even just within the workforce. I mean, you you both are, are clinicians, but then also with respect to those who are giving us our good information, people like Ben who are you know really taking 
taking um, seriously, giving out good information at, at a level that people can understand and grasp and, and appreciate, but then also Dr. Williams, you're meeting people in classrooms. So you're, you're both doing incredible services uh, in and out and around these different uh, spheres. So we, we certainly appreciate you. I, I wanna talk a little bit about the, you know, what happens, you know, after therapeutics, you know, do we talk about vaccine? Do we, you know, what's ongoing care? What does that look like as we're trying to really, to Dr. Gupta's point, save lives and, and, and specifically to avoid, avoid excess mortality? I can um, take a shot at that. I, you know, I, I do think that uh, uh, there's a few things in the pipeline. So probably, I, I guess to provide the qualifier here, Dr. Williams, please, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you are a recipient, if you or a loved one does get a monoclonal antibody, like the, the, this uh, two drug cocktail that uh, Dr. Williams has talked about, you, you should, the guidance is to wait 90 days until you then fall in line for a vaccine. So um, just just so everyone's aware that there is that waiting period after uh, so we, we, because we want you to get the most robust response from the vaccine. So 90 days, wait, then get the vaccine if you do get this therapy. Um, and then talk to your provider just to make sure that there's no particularly unique um, uh, parts to your healthcare journey that may change that, that time frame. Um, you know, Mia, to answer your question, I think uh, we should all anticipate rolling up our sleeves for the foreseeable future every year for a COVID-19 type vaccine to cover for variants. Um, I'm sure, you know, there is some concern that, oh, and uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, Dr. Williams talked about this better than I can, but that these monoclonal therapies will have to be updated as well to cover for the variants um, as they change. And as we, as the various, um, um, as our realities change with respect to the type of variant that we're facing in our communities, the vaccine will be updated. These therapies will be updated. So booster shots, you should expect to get a booster shot end of this year, likely early next year. And then on, on our healthcare system, I, you know, I've seen a lot of patients um, th that continue to experience side effects from, from their battle with COVID-19. Often these are individuals who didn't need require upfront hospitalization. They had mild symptoms, they stayed at home but they have brain fog or they're really fatigued or they're just not able to resume activities of daily living like running, they're, they're walking instead, the so-called long COVID syndrome. And our healthcare system just is not prepared in my view to deal with the onslaught of individuals who are likely to experience this constellation of symptoms. Uh, we don't even have a reimbursement code to, uh, to, to actually uh, allow for uh, uh, compensation of services. Not that that's what matters, but if you don't have that, then you don't have provision of services. So well, there's a lot that is lacking in my view outside of a few dedicated centers of excellence for post COVID care. And this is gonna become a bigger issue in the, in, the, in the coming months as we move away from the acute part of the pandemic and towards <clears throat> dealing with these chronic issues. Yeah, I would just second that. I was actually going to bring that up, the, and, and it's devastating. Some of the, the patients I've seen, primarily from my ICU practice, who've come back to my clinic, and, and just to watch the longstanding effects um, uh, is just dramatic and devastating. I will say regarding what's next, uh, Lily's very, com very committed to helping with solutions for what's next. So we have second generation monoclonal antibodies that we're working on right now. We're racing to get those into, into uh, clinical trials to hopefully be ready to combat if the variants continue to evolve, which they are likely to, to, to continue to evolve. That's what happens with viruses that we wanna be ready we want to be part of the solution. So we, we are very much working on that aggressively. And we, and we hope that once those become, you know, public knowledge and, and accessible, we, we, we can have you back on to talk a bit about more, uh, more about that. I, I, I do want to be clear uh, to be, to have it be clearly stated the, the antibody or excuse me, yeah, the monoclonals themselves are not at all an alternative to the vaccine. Absolutely. Okay. Definitely not an alternative. Right. Yes. 
and, and they are administered to those who are generally, as you mentioned, uh, high risk patients, according to the, the demographics you, you, you laid out, um, yes. the, the characteristics you laid out. And then also, um, it, this is not for, this is not for inpatient. Yes, correct. Okay. You have a positive test and you're, you're within 10 days of that positive test. So it's, you know, if, if you've had COVID for 20 days, that you're beyond the window. So we want to treat these people early. That's where we believe the, the, the drugs will have the most benefit, early treatment. Yes. There we go. So, so the 10-day window. 10-day window. All right. I hope you all got that. I'm sure you do. I'm talking to the audience here. And the, the audience has, has given good questions. So I, I think I've, I've elevated um, most of them. Um, I, I do want to go back a bit and, you know, because we only have a couple of moments left. You know, you're, you're both you're both clinicians, you know, but you're also both people living in this very new age, right? Um, I'm saying new not to sound trite because I imagine that to some extent, while the onslaught of COVID-19 was has been deeply surprising, we've heard and studies have shown for a long time that this is something that we were going to potentially have to, to grapple with, right? So looking back, what do you wish as clinicians and also what do you wish as people we were able to do in advance of such a catastrophic season? You know, and similar to the spirit of my of a former question, moving forward, given that there are going to be additional variants, how can we really learn from now and not repeat? you know, political will aside, individual responsibility aside, like all of those things, how can we not repeat it? What do you wish we had known? How can we not repeat? I'll, t I'll take a stab at it. This and I'll just speak as a, as a, as a practitioner who, who was right in the middle of it, just I'm sure as Dr. Yeah, Gunter 300 was. some odd patients you've treated. I yeah. wish, um, I wish we had been a, a better brother's keeper, to mm. be honest with you, because what I what I what I witnessed, uh, we all value our personal freedom. <laughs> it's what this country is built on, but we are we are more than that, and and we are our brother's keeper. And, and I wish, and and I'll include him. I'll include myself. I wish that the um, the adoption of of masks and distancing and hand washing was was more prevalent and was was more rigorous. Uh, that we all had that mindset of being our brother's keeper. Um, that's just my honest, heartfelt reply to that. And I, I I'm I'm optimistic that we have learned from that because we have to learn from that. I also do hope for a long memory with respect to being, you know, one's, one's keeper, a brother's keeper. Thank you for that. That resonates. Dr. Gupta, how about you? Uh, well, I completely agree with Dr. Williams. Um, I, I guess I would just say that in addition to mindset, there's just policies that, that this country needs to improve preparedness for the next health threat, be it an epidemic or pandemic, and, and you're seeing I think movement in that direction, whether it's uh, increasing our sequencing, genomic sequencing capabilities, so we know when, when variants are popping up, where they're popping up. We just don't have the right type of testing at scale. We need that so you can actually identify the variant. You know, These tests that tell you if you're COVID positive or negative, they don't tell you if you have the variant first identified in the United Kingdom or first identified in South Africa or here in the States, they just tell you you have COVID or sort of, uh, uh, yeah, that you're infected with the virus. So we need that. We need better, high quality, comfortable masking. I will say somebody who's been messaging on masking for the last year. It's hard to constantly go to on a public platform and say, well, we're switching the guidance and, oh, well, now you got to tie the ear loops and, you know, you have jerry rig something at home. We, being here on the West Coast as a pulmonologist, I'll say I have patients for three months out of the year who cannot step outside because there's wildfire smoke um, suffocating major West Coast cities. We know the next pandemic will be a respiratory pandemic. 
at some point we we need the ability to get people high quality well-fitting comfortable masks um, better than what we have right now so innovation and masking is going to be key scaling sequencing and then building up our public health departments so that we have an army of of, of workers who want to do that job, who are adequately compensated, who can be contact tracers, vaccinators, who can staff mobile testing sites as we need them so that we, we have that connective tissue when we need it, not trying to ramp it up um, on the fly. So during the setting of a crisis. So, I mean, I, I do think those things are happening. Uh, we, uh, I just hope that they continue to happen across administrations, across uh, transit future tr presidential transition so that it's not just a, a four-year effort every every few terms for sure innovation uh investments with respect to policies as as, as as well as public health infrastructure and then to dr williams point togetherness and and truly embracing what it means to be a community and and we didn't so much use these words today but the the irony of, of this whole situation is you know We've we've closed ourselves for the sake of of keeping and containing contagion, but this is a a, a worldwide situation, and in a lot of ways, it's brought our our borders close much closer together. Um, so there's so much to take away. And in the last moment, I'll just give you all um, thirty seconds each or so. Final final takeaway for the for the audience today. I'm optimistic. I, I think we have learned a lot from this, and um, I believe the innovation that we've seen um, in terms of getting vaccines to the patients quickly, getting drugs like monoclonal antibodies uh, in the middle of a pandemic at, at record speed, uh, the innovations in, in clinical trials, um, we can we can build on that. That's that's foundation that hopefully will improve the quality of people's and of life and and save lives in the future in a variety of areas. So, to me, it's it's there's never been a more exciting time to be in the field of drug development, and um, it's um, it's it's a there's a lot of promise in in the setting of uh, a lot of uh, despair. To be honest with you, I would just build on that and say. This was this was a horrible, and I think largely hope. Uh, I, in, in, I think largely preventable event. Uh, but I think we've learned a lot, as Dr. Williams said, both across innovation and science and just public policy more broadly. And I think public health now is top of mind for everybody in the world, everybody here in the United States. And I think that's going to ultimately be a good thing. I agree, and I'm heartened that the both of you are are using words like good thing and promise and optimism alongside of you know prevention and 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 grappling with the realities of despair a lot of people have, have been in dark places but we're, we're certainly um holding on to light um so so you know without further ado dr mark williams thank you so very much for joining us today senior medical director of the COVID 19 therapeutic platform at eli Lilly and company we appreciate your colleagues for for giving us some of your time as well i'm sure that they are you know pulling at you a lot um, and so I hope that you remain well and Dr. Vingupta as always it is a pleasure to spend time with you and we appreciate you coming and bringing your perspective from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington um, so I, I'll certainly be keeping both of you in my in my thoughts and, and, and sending you warmth and hope the same for your families and um, yeah thank you so very much for joining us and as always to the to the NMQF family, thank you so much for, for always having me on Friday. I'm Mia Keys from the American Medical Association Center for Health Equity, closing out, and uh, we look forward to um, future conversations. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.